Hi, everyone. It's been that kind of day. A long day. <laughs> oh, my God. What a day. Hi, everyone. So nice to be back at the 92nd Street Y, where my daughter went to preschool. I used oh to live gosh. a block away, so I'm really happy to be here. And it's great to be here with Mika to talk about so much. Mm. So I hope you guys have your little file cards ready, um, because I'm sure you're going to come up with some excellent questions. But Mika, I, I just feel like, uh, first of all, congratulations on uh, your new book, on, on Know Your Value, which is, I think, a, an updated version. Re-release, yep, Re -release. a lot of updates. And we, we're going to talk about the book, but of course we have to talk about what happened today. How many of you watch? watch I'll watch. Today? Oh my gosh. Could not leave the TV. Yep. So, gosh, you know, I personally am feeling like I'm still processing it. Yeah. Uh, it was an extraordinary day, I think, in the history of our country. And as you watch Mika, I watched most of it. I had to do some other things sort of intermittently. Um, but I watched certainly uh, the vast majority of Dr. Ford's testimony and uh, Judge Kavanaugh's opening statement and some of the questioning. So I feel like I have a pretty good feel, but I did not watch it from start to finish. Um, did you watch it from start to finish? I watched, I had kind of a busy day as well, but I watched probably three quarters of it throughout the whole day and, and most of the most dramatic moments, I think. What, what was your gut? What's your gut? Your gut um, takeaway? I thought Dr. Ford was extraordinarily credible. Um, my heart broke for her because I think they're is so much that we don't discuss and don't understand about the trauma of sexual assault, the frequency of sexual assault, the last long, lifelong effects of sexual assault. Um, and I thought she was, uh, comported herself extremely well. Mm -hmm. um, and then honestly, you know, there was a part of me, I think you can't be a human being that watched Judge Kavanaugh and saw sort of what he was going through and I felt for him in a way too. Mm -hmm. But having said that, um, you know, I felt she was very credible and this, as someone said, I think on Morning Joe this morning, this is not a legal proceeding, it's a job interview. And I think we have to consider the character of our Supreme Court justices and um, it's not my decision, it's not up to me to decide if it's disqualifying, but um, I think there are a lot of questions about his character and his conduct. Hmm. It was, I, I cried during both opening statements, during hers and his. Um, I feel for the entire situation. I couldn't get, take my eyes off of his wife. Um, really feel for her. Think about their daughters. Um, and Dr. Ford's story was riveting. And I found it gripping just reading it, let alone hearing her say it and seeing her sit there so uncomfortable, so not ready for this, and so thrust into it. And I have questions about how she ended up there in the first place and exactly how her story came out. And you I feel that she explained that pretty well in the question. She tried, yeah, yes. But I still feel really uncomfortable about, I think, Everybody is very uncomfortable watching these two people basically fend for themselves in the public arena. I am horrified at what's happening in the media right now, and I just can't help but to believe that this is exactly what Donald Trump wants. And that's what really discourage me, discourages me the most about it. How so? What do you mean it's what he wants? Because he... Um, takes great pride in sowing doubt in the truth, and sowing doubt in people, and defaming people, and, and also savagely ripping against, them to shreds. Pit, pitting people against Pitting people, people against each other and watching it like you're at a cockfight. That's what it felt like today. It didn't feel right. It didn't feel like we were gonna get to the truth or to justice. And I would say just sort of as a news person, the only real takeaway or the only analysis that I feel comfortable offering is that I found it I, I thought it was notable that he hedged at an FBI investigation. And if you want to clear your name, come on, just take it, bring it on. I mean, well, it's the only, not only, the whole. not only he, but 
the Senate Judiciary of Committee. Obviously, I think when Anita Hill wrote about this, and I covered the Anita Hill, Clarence Thomas confirmation hearings, you know, 27 years ago. God, I'm old. Um, yeah, and, exactly. And, and, and I thought it was very telling that Anita Hill wrote that piece in the New York Times mm -hmm. that this should not be rushed, there should be an FBI investigation, and that she was amazed that now, so many years later, there still is not a process in place right. to handle this. And it felt so JV. You know, it yeah. felt like they really didn't know what was going on. They didn't subpoena this Mark judge who was the only per other person in the room. If they wanted to really find the truth, they should have brought him in to testify. Mm -hmm. So much of it just didn't smell right yep. in terms of how, how the process worked or didn't work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I also have an issue. I, honestly, I'm confused about Dianne Feinstein. I, mm -hmm. I guess she went to the, the Senate Ethics Committee, but it seems like this should have come out much earlier yeah. than it did because I think it gave an opportunity for people to feel that it was politicized and weaponized when if it had been dealt with at the time it was written, I think some of those questions might not have uh, surfaced. Yeah. And this is what this is exactly what I think this president is sowing is is reaping. I mean, I think this type of division, this type of mudslinging that's happening on Twitter right now, I I couldn't even go on during the hearings because it was so ugly on both sides. And people I know who are just going there and ripping to shreds one or the other. Why? Let's not do this right now. Let's take a step back. Let's let the facts come out. But how are the facts going to come out if, well, not they're voting, that way. if they're voting tomorrow, there was not an FBI investigation, and this is what we have, one woman saying one thing, one man saying another thing, uh, people being able to interpret who they believe. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how, how does that advance the conversation? It, it doesn't. To me, I'm very perplexed by the whole thing. It doesn't. So is he going to be confirmed in your view? I don't know. I mean, he might. <laughs> um, I don't think he should be, but um, that was before this even happened. Um, and that's something we talked about on the show. Um, and today was just, it left a really sick feeling in the pit of my stomach, not only about politics, but about the media and about... Um, the state Women's of discourse. Voices. The state of discourse, which, you know, I feel like we're making a lot of headway right now as women. But it, I'm worried. I hope this isn't a setback. I don't know what's going to happen. Didn't feel right, though. None of it. Well, I, I was impressed by her. Yeah, I, I was to too. I mean, and I think, I think the fact, best. I did believe, uh, agree with Patrick Leahy and Dick Durbin, Patrick Leahy in particular, and that I think her courage will give other people courage, we hope, depending on the outcome, I guess. Well, let's, let's move on and talk about sort of uh, another really happy topic, Me Too. Oh, okay. Time's up. <laughs> uh, uh, so, you know, we, you and I have witnessed this seismic, really a seismic change in the way I think uh, we deal with men and women in the workforce mm -hmm. and how women are treated, uh, you know, I used to make a joke, uh, but I don't make it anymore, but I will because I like the 92nd Street Y. I used to say that I got in TV news when harass was two words instead of one. <laughs> and, 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 and actually, in some quarters, I think it is still two words, and that's the problem, <laughs> right? Um, what do you make uh, as you saw this movement unfold, particularly in our business? Yeah. Of course, it hit very close to home for me. Mm -hmm. uh, with with the termination of Matt Lauer, someone with Same whom here. I worked yep. for almost a decade, actually more better more than a decade, when he was newsreader and then co-anchor of the Today Show, um, Mark Halperin, mm -hmm. who was a frequent guest on Morning Absolutely. Joe. Yep. Um, obviously, CBS. We have Charlie Rose, Les Moonves, and Jeff Fager most recently. Um, there's a lot of other names and other news organizations, but. Tell me your thoughts as you saw this sort of happen and these people getting fired one by one. Well, uh, it's, it's quite a reckoning, I think, for not just men in our industry, but men across the board in business. 
And um, it's an interesting conversation, a careful conversation, because I really do believe in due process. I really do. And I, I think we have to always come back to that. Um, having said that, we've had decades there where women have felt that they can't speak or have been kept quiet. And we are taking a step back, I think, in some ways, and take a microscope to our industry before we take a few steps forward. Um, I have a feeling that, well, my hope is that Me Too actually opens doors for our daughters. I mean, I'm hoping that the culture changes and that they don't even have to think about the things we've had to think about. Um, and I think that this process gets us there. We have to be careful. I think there's an over, we need due process. We're gonna have to not only find our voices, but use them and handle the questions and handle the process because we can't just be, we can't own the world. We want to be an equal part of it. Um, and I think it's, it's a slippery slope if we just have a voice and that's it and we can take people down. Well, that's the question. How do you move from active, active, activism to action? In other words, what can be done to help move toward a solution to a more level playing field, more opportunities for women, an environment where everyone can thrive. What do you think needs to be, in a, and have you as, you know, you're at NBC, my mm -hmm. old stomping grounds, have you seen real change happening there? I have. Tell I us have. about that. Um, I, I, I see a lot of people talking about it. And if we're gonna have an honest conversation, I think the answer to the question is not just what we're doing, which is speaking out telling our stories, talking about situations we were either sexually assaulted or sexually harassed, and how we handled it or not, and how we get through this. Um, I think that men who behave badly do not deserve to be working in this incredible, you know, these institutions that we have the honor of being a part of. Um, but I think ultimately, and I talk a lot about this uh, in the Know Your Value community, it's about Hiring good people, not just people who are really good at what they do, but really good people for the same reasons, good men and good women. It should matter if a man is a smooth operator or, you know, has a crazy um, private life where he's, you know, dating chicks all over the office. That just shouldn't be happening. That's not someone you want to hire. And same with women. Women who don't play the game fairly as well and use their sexuality to take advantage of people, you know, we don't talk about that at all. I'm sure you've seen it in this business. I'm sure. We've, we've been in the television business and it's quite an interesting journey. <laughs> yeah, it's not really my jam, but it's I have not mine either. seen it. <laughs> but I mean, you'd, you'd have to be blind not to see what happens in this business or what has happened in the 10, 20, 30 years ago when we were starting out. And the types of people that you know, we felt that we were in competition with, I mean, it was kind of crazy, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah, but I also think, I mean, I think there are a couple things that can be done. I think women need to be in leadership positions, mm -hmm. and I don't mean fake leadership positions. I mean be positions good. of real, yeah. yes, of course they have to be good, but there are plenty of great women out there mm -hmm. who should be given real authority and decision-making ability. I think that's incredibly important if we're gonna change the culture. Because I have found through all these panels and conversations, it really starts at the top. And the leadership has to make this a priority. Absolutely. And right now, all the network news presidents are men. All, the vast majority of executive producers are men. The three people doing evening newscasts are men. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, I think that that says a lot about how far we you know, need to go and how much we need to still do in terms of integrating the very top positions. Absolutely, I mean, we had an, uh, um, Deborah Turness was president of NBC, so we, we just are the last iteration. But of we course, that was sort of the, you know, Pat Philly was, of course. And Pat Philly, and Pat Philly. Was amazing. And, uh, but when women fail, we Actually, this. Pat Philly Crucial's um, green lighted Know Your Value. And she was the one person, she just said, you know what, this is amazing, go with it. And just sort of rammed it through, it was amazing. She and Phil Griffin. But what happened to Pat Philly? Isn't she, I think she's working at Comcast, where is, her, where is she? 
she is. But the, I think the, the, the fact is there's this thing called the glass cliff too, mm -hmm. right? When a woman uh, is not considered successful in a position, and we've seen this time and time again, and it doesn't work out for whatever reason, it often, I think, is inflated as this didn't work out, and it keeps other women, I think, from getting those jobs in the future. And that's why they even call it the glass cliff. So, you know, I feel like women need to be put in these leadership jobs. And I also think that, you know, diversity and training, the EEOC did a study and said that nobody takes those seriously. And I'm wondering, is there a, diff a different approach now at NBC about diversity training, about sexual harassment training, and is it taken much more seriously? Now HR is actually a cool, sexy job, people say. <laughs> <laughs> and there are suddenly newfound respect for people who are in human resources. Yeah, I mean, they're uh, putting people through a lot of different types of sexual harassment training, I think, at NBC. Um, and I think it's new. Um, there were some programs I think in the past, the GE Women's Network, and now we have Know Your Value at Comcast and NBC. And I really feel that part of the equation is elevating women and not only giving them a voice, but teaching them how to communicate it effectively, which is everything that I'm fighting for in, with, with the program that we've developed. We go around the country. Comcast has brought us in to work with all of the compact Comcast NBC employees, and it is about being able to go and ask for help, to address if you have a problem, how to communicate in the moment, to push back in the moment if you're having an issue with someone, but also how to elevate your own stature so you stay at the company for a long time and you are successful there and you are able to become a leader as a woman. Well, we're gonna talk more about sort of the, the whole ethos of know your value and, and your aha moment <laughs> in, in realizing that you, you needed to know your value and help other women know theirs. But I want the audience to get to know you a little bit better mm -hmm. before we do that and, and talk a little bit, because you've had such an interesting uh, upbringing. In, in, you know, of course, your dad was, was the big new Brzezinski. He was a diplomat, political science counselor to, to LBJ and to Jimmy Carter. He was his national security advisor. He was one of the first people I had to mention in a live shop, by the way, oh, when I was no. at CNN. I was like 22, and they let me do a live shop from the White House. I was 20, maybe 23, and I was so bad. And I was oh. like, today the president is meeting with White House security advisors of Big New Brzezinski. And I was so excited that I pronounced his name correctly. And then the president of CNN told me, <laughs> I didn't. No, it's OK. The president of CNN said, we never want her on the air again. Oh. So maybe I didn't do a good no. job pronouncing his name. <laughs> but you know, meanwhile, your mom's an incredible She's artist. Mm -hmm. um, she is a, a, an audit, a, a chainsaw artist. She yes. creates, and I've seen some of her work actually. They would, they would be taller than my book behind me. Um, she, she, massive. she sculpts using a chainsaw. She does, and she's watching right now online, oh. my mom. And, Hello, but Mrs. She's, um, she works with a chainsaw <laughs> and with a chisel and an ax. And she has a um, show ongoing right now at the Katzen Gallery in Washington, D.C. And some of her pieces are literally in the driveway of the Krieger Museum in Washington, D.C. And she's shown around the world. She's incredible. You must have had the most amazing dinner table conversations growing up. Wow. They were amazing. Well, my, my father, well, first of all, there, there's, I've got two older brothers. Ian's the Republican and he worked in the Bush administration, and Joe likes to say he's such a neocon, he would invade Canada. Um, <laughs> and then my brother Mark was ambassador to Sweden for President Obama, worked in the Clinton administration, the National Security Council, and my father liked to to, like all of us to debate. And we debated everything from politics to, um, when I was in ninth grade, I was sent to Madeira, which is a girls' school, and I interviewed with um, Jean Harris, and then she went to jail. The Scarsdale, and then yeah. I got in. I don't know what that means. Scars well, she yeah. She's, so she we killed had, Herman Tarnow, the author of the Scarsdale Diet, and I went on that diet. And I wanted to kill him too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hard. It was hard. So, yeah. my mom and my dad started a family debate on crime of passion. And we literally duked it out for two hours over the dinner table as to whether or not like crimes of passion are different. 
And um, so that was my that entrance into private school as a ninth grader was like, I would go in there saying, okay, was it a crime of passion? And is that okay? Apparently my mother thought it was okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you had all sorts of interesting people, I imagine, coming in your house. And was it, I mean, did you have interesting conversations? And tell us some of the dinner guests you had through the years. Well, um, some of the, we had incredible conversations and, and dinners, but they were always like in our family riddled with, with like disaster. So some of the stories that come to mind is having um, the leader of China um, come to dinner at our house, Deng Xiaoping. And it was when, um, well, there was supposed to be a state dinner at the White House. They were opening relations, and th he wanted to come to our house. My father invited him. My mom's like, are you kidding me? I'm making dinner for Deng Xiaoping, okay. <laughs> and my mother refuses to hire a caterer. We like hunt for our food and grow our crops in McLean, Virginia. <laughs> And um, I was very young, and we were all doing everything, taking coats. Um, we didn't open the flue when we were lighting a fire, and the house got smoked out. My mother opened champagne and hit my dad in the face. And <laughs> then I, at one point, spilled caviar, literally tripped, and spilled it on Deng Xiaoping's crotch. Oh. Oh. And then wiped it off. So. Um, <laughs> And Alrighty. like he was right next to Cyrus Vance, and I don't know if you remember, there was like a little tension between my dad and Cyrus Vance, and I think I caused it, but I do, I really do. So that was one. The other was dinner with the Pope. Really? Pope John Paul II, um, which was a very last minute thing. That actually happened at the British Embassy, but my dad called my mom and said, we're having dinner with the Pope. Get the boys, get Mika, and show up at the British Embassy. And so I was good, Mark was good, but Ian, the Republican, uh, <laughs> was difficult. And he showed up with like ripped jeans and Timberland boots open. And my dad was like, are you kidding me? And the Pope was so nice, Pope John Paul II. He was adorable and winked at my mom. And then they sit down. And of course, my parents like to do debate. And my dad's like slinking in the chair because he's like, don't take this show on the road, Mushka. She starts to debate him on the role of women in the Catholic Church <laughs> and birth control. <laughs> and it was just, you know, it was awkward. Um, there are so many. There was roadkill. My mother served roadkill. Okay. My mother served roadkill. I'm just going to keep drinking. To, <laughs> to Pamela Harriman, my, my parents are like Eastern European immigrants, and they they really don't want to change. And so my mother on the way to school one day, uh, she picked me up from at Madeira. And she was covered not just with sawdust in her little like jumpsuit, she, which she uses in the studio, which is, oh, she's watching. That's OK. <laughs> oh, well. Um, and there was a deer in the car. It was dead. And she got it off the side of the road. And she actually pulled over and checked, and it was still warm, and thought it was worth not, yeah, thought it was not worth wasting. And then she says a farmer stopped and split it with her, got out his tools, and split it with her, and she was bragging that she got the best part. Did she cook it? Just tell me where a farmer shows up from in McLean, Virginia, on Old Dominion Road, and like only my mom, right? She cooked it. She served it at dinner to Pamela Harriman, among others. And everyone was saying, who's your caterer? And she's like, I don't have a caterer. I got this on the side of the road. <laughs> wow. And uh, I just remember going, wow, my mom. I love that. <laughs> she's different. <laughs> <laughs> but she's amazing. And you know, to this day, she's like, what's the deal? I mean, she's probably sitting right now going, what? I don't, you don't waste. Um, and she's very practical, and she does not care what people think, and you got to love it. You know, I think people, yeah, let's give a, a round, round of, applause. of applause for Mika's mom. Thank you. Um, you know, I, you have this incredibly exciting and stimulating childhood, and yet I know, because I interviewed you for this book, that you were also, uh, you know, haunted by these feelings of self-doubt mm -hmm. and insecurity and not being good enough. I know you wrestled with an eating disorder yep. for some time. Um, and, and I'm curious how you were able, I think this probably might surprise some people, but how were you able to kind of find yourself and get that confidence that you needed to pursue a career in a very competitive 
um, you know, feel that it has a lot of pressure attached to it? I think that it's funny. You kind of usually find yourself in life, and most of us have been around long enough, I think, uh, when you hit rock bottom, you know? That's sort of when it doesn't matter anymore and you all of a sudden start going, okay, I'm just gonna go forward. Um, so I feel like the first couple of decades even of my career is sort of not, I wanted so badly to be there, I almost wanted too badly to be there. And it sort of took getting fired and you know, really hitting some roadblocks in life, real ones. Give us the quick, uh CV for us, sort of what your career path was. Local news, um, morning anchor, um, night beat reporter, 10, 12 years in Hartford, Connecticut, overnight anchor, CBS News, working all night, had my second child on the overnight shift, had a terrible accident going back to work too soon um, with my baby, um, which haunted me for a long time and made me even question everything I was doing even more, I was always questioning everything I was doing. And you could see me doing that, which I think impacted every negotiation I was ever a part of. And it's sort of why Know Your Value means so much to me, because when I wrote about all those mistakes, I realized how much, how I felt about my own value impacted how much I was paid, and simple things like that, or what I got back in a relationship, a friendship, um, a working partnership. And um, I think, Getting fired took it all away from me. Not being able to find a job for a year made me really hungry. And that was from CBS? From CBS. I was, I was actually fired when you were hired. Oh my god, yeah. <laughs> Sorry! <laughs> no, I really was. It was the week before you were hired. I was the weekend anchor. Well, I wish you had been there because I could have used a friend. I know, I know. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's a tough business. And I, I always sort of, half of me, I loved it there, I loved the work, I loved the balance I had struck finally. I felt like my kids came into work with me and I anchored on the weekend, they were under the desk and kind of felt like I'd had, I felt like I had had it all figured out and the rug was literally yanked, like, like that. Um, and um, it was a real identity crisis. It hurt, it felt um, painful and embarrassing and I really, I was sad about it, incredibly. And I tried to sort of spin it when I got home to my daughters. I was like, great news, everybody, great news. Um, <laughs> girls, I'm gonna be around a lot more. <laughs> and they're both like, huh? like Amelia froze. Carly was like, what? And um, Amelia immediately was like, wait, you can't leave CBS. That's the only re reason the lady at the library likes me. You can't leave. <laughs> and Carly was very quiet. She was the younger one. They were eight and six. And um, I'm like, that's right. I'm going to be here. I'm going to be with you 100%. It's great news. And the next day, the teacher called. And she never called me because she you know, would always either send an email or try and reach me somehow, but called me directly. And I'm like, hey, I'm available. Um, and she said, can you come in? Because Carly's upset. And I was like, I will be right there. And I, you know, I go in, I'm like, I'm, I'm available. And Carly's sitting down, um, like up against the lockers like this. And the teacher leans down and she goes, Carly told me that you're leaving CBS. I know it's not public yet. And I was like, is she judging me? I'm telling, I'm being judged right now, aren't I? Um, and I was like, uh, I am, Carly, I am. And I looked at her. And I said, I, I'm going to have more time with you. It's, it's good news. And she just looked up with these two big blue eyes, tears in them, and she goes, you can't leave CBS. You love it so much, Mommy. And I remember I started crying about the firing right there in front of my daughter, which, of course, made the teacher judge me even more. <laughs> I was like crazy. And I was so sad. And, I, you know, kids know. Yeah, they know, and they're you, also you don't have so to hide help, it. They're so helpful. They're so I had a, I had a, I had a night at dinner with my daughters uh, when I was getting some really bad press when I was anchoring the CBS Evening News. And I think I probably was crying at dinner because it was a particularly rough day or maybe a whole series of really bad articles uh, that I thought were really kind of unfair. And my daughter was 10, and she said, Mom, Remember what Samantha says in Sex and the City? And I'm thinking, oh God, 
I, I'm letting my 10-year-old watch Sex and the City. This is so <laughs> wrong. She said, oh. if I listened to what every bitch in New York City said about me, I'd never leave the house. Oh, my God. And I said, yeah, you're right. I said, that's I a good. Daughters. I love daughters. It was so right and yet so wrong. <laughs> <Exactly>. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> that's perfect. But, you know, um, so let's, let's talk about know, know Your Value, because I feel like so much of your journey has kind of gotten you to this place where you have, you know, you do know your value and you're, you embrace your value. But I was interested in reading in the book that, that being on Morning Show made you literally wake up and smell the coffee because yeah. um, you realized at some moment in time, the show was doing well, mm -hmm. that your, your co-host, Joe Scarborough, and Billy. huh? And Willie. And Willie. Well, well I, I'm particularly talking about Joe because you mentioned in the book, mm -hmm. you said uh, that you got mad as hell. You weren't going to take it anymore. That's my description, not yours. And you write, let me be clear. There's no question that Joe was worth more to the show's success than anyone. But was he really worth 14, was he really 14 times more valuable than me? So I would say no. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, when, and, when and how, Mika, did you realize, because I think this is a problem because there's not much transparency in, in various fields, when did you realize you were being so underpaid compared to your co-anchor? Uh, all of them. It was everybody, all the men on the set, and there were a couple. We, we had... Uh, Joe Willie, we had the EP Chris Licht and Mike Barnacle, and it started to evolve over the course of a year or two. And everybody got contracts. And you know, if Willie's negotiation wasn't going the way his agent, maybe maybe Willie didn't show up. I mean, there were a couple of days Willie was off, and I was like, did he just do that? Guys, do that, and we're like, oh, we could never do that. I would <laughs> never not show up. Um, guys, put it on the line. And meanwhile, for me, I was like, oh, thank you so much. Just for a job, just for anything, just to be back in. And I miss the moment. And a lot of the things that I talk about, about women and knowing their value, is that we have got to push back in real time. We've got to learn to press reset in our relationship with people all the time. Guys are so good at it because they forget everything. And <laughs> we've got to be able to advocate for ourselves when the moment is hot, when the, you know, strike while the iron is hot. The show was doing great. But I was surprised to read, Mika, that one morning you were gonna just pack it all in. You were gonna be like, you know what? And that just doesn't sound like you. Well, y you mean when I went in and said, you need to pay me or I'm leaving? No, well, when you met with Joe and you said- Oh, yeah. You said one morning, I think you might have been at the restaurant that's right outside the skating rink. Mm -hmm. uh, I know it well. And you might have said, you said to him, you know what? This, this basically, this sucks and I'm, I'm out of here. So the reason I said that is because I feel like the show is based on sort of our gut feeling every morning. And it's funny, it's serious, it's real, it's raw. We don't, you know, plan what we're gonna say. And I mean, there were times like I was having sleeping problems and you would know if I took an Ambien the night before because chances are I would say it. I mean, it'd be like that, uh, you know, sometimes a little ridiculous. But I knew that if I didn't address this and walk away from it, that the relationship would turn, the entire relationship with the viewers, with everybody on the set, with NBC, would turn bad. And the one who would ultimately perform the worst would be me. And I was in that process there of figuring out my value. And part of it was really vocalizing this process that I didn't want to have happen to me, which was to end up angry, to be uh, resentful, to feel like everyone screwed me over. I needed to fix it. You thought that bitterness out. would kind of Absolutely. permeate the and show. And I think we tend to do that on a lot of levels. I think women really struggle with speaking up in real time, with putting on the line, putting your money where your mouth is. Like, by the way, not publishing a book that's connected with Harvey Weinstein, take the money back, thank you, 
goodbye. Like, we got to do stuff in the moment. We've got to go with our gut. Sometimes I think we think about everything so much that we not only miss the moment, but we ruin it. <laughs> and so we've got to get that voice going. Well, I imagine since you had had that experience at CBS, that you were, you were reticent to go and you didn't want to be perceived as demanding. You were still grateful that you had a job. Exactly, The exactly. show was going gangbusters. So you were like, I don't want to rock the boat. And right. I'm so appreciative I'm here. Ugh. So how did you break Those through that? Those are all the mistakes. Like I did that at CBS every step of the way. And I think that, I think that I wasn't as good as I could have been at CBS ever because I didn't do that, because I didn't say what I needed. I didn't, you know, when I, when I had a baby, I rushed back, I didn't say what I needed. You know, I needed to listen to my body and not come back. The job would have been fine. But why are we so worried all the time? Why are we so grateful? Why are we navigating these feelings and wearing them? Like at some point, you're good at what you do and you need to own it. And you need to be able to say it every single day. I could never do that at CBS. Uh, throughout my, I say at CBS, I went from WFSB in Hartford to CBS to MSNBC, back to CBS, and now I'm here at MSNBC. So throughout my jobs before the age of 40, really, I just don't feel I was as good as I could have been because I wasn't wearing it. Guys are amazing. They'll say things that they don't even believe about how good they are, okay? <laughs> I mean, hate to use Joe as an example, but, um, <laughs> but honestly, this is an amazing story and it is a compliment. He's not, this is not a laugh line. You know, when the show was starting, he believed in it. He believed that a three-hour conversation about really interesting topics, that there would be not only a need and a desire for it, but a hunger for it, for smart morning television. And he thought that if he put a bunch of smart people around the table and those smart people talked about what they wanted to talk about and not what they were being told to talk about by some producer on a different floor, that perhaps people would want to watch that. And then he went in to Phil Griffin and to everybody in NBC and he said, I'm going to put on a show with really smart people. We're going to talk for 10, 20 minutes, sometimes even 30, we'll blow through breaks, and we're going to talk about really smart political issues. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to say, you give me this contract and, um, I'm going to beat Imus, the show that just got thrown off the air. It's the highest rated show on MSNBC. I'm going to beat it. And in fact, I'm so sure I'm going to beat it. Why don't you give me ratings bonuses every time I do? Here's how much. And you know, the laughing happened. Well, sure, you'll beat Imus, whatever, I'll sign that. Guess what he's been doing for 11 years, ever since the show started, what we've been doing as a team, uh, beating Imus and then some. Now, I don't know where he got that. Who thinks that way? A guy. <laughs> <laughs> All guys. And it's amazing. And we'll have what they're having because it's pretty useful in a negotiation. Well, let and me I ask never you a question. I, I always was like, gosh darn it, I hope I'll please ya. <laughs> like, you. Like, that's, just, not, you were just that's not hot. You were just okay. channeling Sarah Palin. I know, really? Yeah. Oh, well, um, in memory you of your betcha. <laughs> um, so, so, but, but in, in fairness, I mean, if you had come up with that idea, I mean, this is part of the problem. If you had come up with this idea, and you had gone to Phil Griffin, you, mm. Mika, mm -hmm. and said, hey, I've got this idea. Yeah. And I want rating bonuses. Mm -hmm. What do you think the reaction would be? So I don't know what the reaction to that would have been, because I wouldn't have thought of that. But let me give you Let's a Let's just pretend you did. I wouldn't have thought of that, because that's not how women think. But let me tell you what I've learned since that moment and what I did do with that message. I came up with this amazing concept. It's called Know Your Value. I wrote an amazing book. And women read it across the country, and many of them come up to me and tell me they've read it and they've got raises. This book has worked. And I saw that reaction and I thought, hmm, I need to do more with it. Hmm, what should I do? I want to do something on television with it. You know what? I want to do a TV show. You know what? I want to go around the country and want to teach women to know their value. I want to create a business called Know Your Value. And you know what I did? I didn't ask for permission 
I did it. I actually went to Hartford, Connecticut. You met Robin backstage and Doobie backstage? I met them in Connecticut. I met Robin at CBS and Doobie was the political reporter at WFSB. I called two of the most talented women I've ever met and I said, we're gonna start a business in Hartford. It's called Know Your Value. Let's do a workshop, let's do a big event and let's get Gail King, our friend, to come up. Let's get some CEOs on stage and let's talk about women and negotiating and let's talk about everything that's in this book. I didn't ask for permission. I went to Hartford. I did this event at the Hartford Downtown Marriott. It was sold out, and there was a line outside the door. Women came in from all walks of life. I had CEOs sitting next to women from the north end of Hartford with no jobs. They all were attracted to three words, know your value, and they wanted to know their value. It was an amazing day. It made a profit. I went to NBC. I sat down with Phil Griffin and Pat Philly Crucial, and I said, this is what I did. And do you want to do it with me? And they looked at me like, you did what? <laughs> Wait a minute, you're not, um, and I'm like, it's done. I did it, and it was awesome. Look at the blueprints. Do you want to do it with me? And I would have never done that. I would have never, I would have never in a million years thought of going out on my own, taking an idea that I believe in, and just nailing it. And I did, and it was an amazing day. It, at the end of the day, I actually was like, I can't believe what I've created because these women came from everywhere. They were sitting on the edge of their seats. They were learning all these incredible things. We were speaking in a language with tips and strategies that they could take home and put into place tomorrow. And we even created in three weeks' time, I don't even know how Doobie and Robin got this through legal, a bonus competition where we had people sending in on their phones videos of why they have value. And I said, on WFSB in Hartford, I did like a PSA. I'm not even sure I was allowed to do that. And I said, you know, come to the downtown Marriott in Hartford on May 5th, and you know what, send in a video right now and tell me in a minute or less why you have value and why you deserve a $10,000 bonus. And I said, and by the way, then play it for yourself and see how bad you are and do it again, and make it better, and make it your best, and send it to us. And we had five finalists, and we had them pitching on stage, and Katie, like, the stories were, this is like your wheelhouse, because you go around America, you talk about diet, you talk about food, you talk about life, you want to know people's stories. This was incredible, because it was everything that we love in one day doing something amazing. We had, um, a woman from the north end of Hartford who was in her 70s who wanted to open an animal sanctuary, an African-American woman. We had a woman from Avon, Connecticut who was divorced. Her husband dumped her and she had three daughters and she wanted to open an exercise studio in her basement. She wanted to pitch her value. We had a woman who just moved to town from Houston and wanted to open a dress store and she had designs pasted up on her bathroom wall. We had a um, woman named Jennifer Hotchkiss who worked as an assistant in a company in Connecticut, and she was 28, 28 year old single mom, and she wanted to go to college. And she had this great voice and this great presence, and she was like, I'm tired, I want to go to college, I've got a kid, I wanna be the boss someday, and she had this incredible pitch. And then we had this woman in her 50s who was fired from Wall Street, who lived in Madison, Connecticut, who opened a secondhand store for little kids' clothing. She wanted to start a website to be like the community hub for moms. Her name was Darcy. She had a tube coming out of her shirt, and she was amazing. And I'm telling you, I couldn't even get over her pitch and Jennifer Hotchkiss. Darcy won. And as I was hugging her, I'm like, what's, are you okay? What's the tube? And she's like, oh my God, Mika, I had heart surgery 48 hours ago, but I have to be here. I'm in a wheelchair. And I was like, please don't die. <laughs> and then um, the, the curtain was gonna go down and this woman stood up in the audience and Jennifer Hodgkiss had said, I wanna go to Bay Path College and get a degree. It's in Hartford. And she happened to be the CMO of Bay Path College. And she stood up and she said to the runner up, and I, I, I get like really, I get. The clamp does I get totally weak when I think about this moment. <laughs> she gave her a full ride on the spot. And I realized, I, I like got off script. I was like, this is it. This is the rest of my life. Because I want to tell you all, if you don't put yourself out there, you never know what will happen. And that's knowing your value. We have to put ourselves out there and speak for ourselves, and she did. That's it was amazing. It. And, and so now from that, from that event in Hartford, emanated this whole movement, yeah. these books, 
And you know, I always like to make sure the audience has some takeaway, um, and we'll get some to some questions after that. But so help us. How do you know your value, and how does it manifest in it in your daily life? I.e., you have to. You know, how do you go about doing that? Right. I tell women to start practicing every day. Like we talked earlier about apologizing, because it's something we do. We back into conversations. We self-deprecate, and we want to make everybody feel comfortable. We want to make sure everybody's warm and cozy in their seats and happy and that they really like us. And that's just a bad start. You know, I notice that. So I'm on the board of Robin Hood, and I notice the women on the board say things like, before they make a, a, a a statement or want to contribute something to the conversation, they'll be like, maybe this doesn't make sense, but, or mm. I'm just spitballing, exactly. but, you know, and That's none of crazy. the men do that. And I noticed it actually, as I sat in these board meetings, that there is a very different way of communicating and stop apologizing before you make yeah. a statement, right? Here's what I think. Here's what I know. Why can't we start that way? And, um, but I think it's an everyday process for women. I urge them to speak in public. I mean, this for me is nerve wracking. I do it because it's important that we can do this. You don't look very nervous. Oh, I'm, I get Have some more wine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. No, I really get nervous in, in group settings and crowds. I'm really? This is such a nice crowd. I know. Well, we love the 90 seconds to <laughs> fly. Although my mom is mad at me. I can feel it. <laughs> I think um, it's fine. Oh, but, um, <laughs> and then, you know, there are tips and strategies that I have in the book and I do in the workshops, but some of them are as simple as what I've said. Learn to press reset. When you have an awkward conversation, usually we wear it. We, oh gosh, we think about it. Like, like I could imagine meeting you or meeting someone in the business and being awkward and then like thinking about it for months. Like why? Just reset. Next time you see the person, be even better. And they'll forget it. In fact, men always forget everything, so don't worry if it's a guy. Um, what about negotiating, Mika? Because so much of this, and, 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 and I think uh, bridging the pay gap, I, I saw the World Economic Forum said it was going to take 217 years to bridge the pay gap between yeah. men and women worldwide. I'm very excited about celebrating that day. But, um, <laughs> You know, what can be done to make incremental changes in terms of how women negotiate? And, and they have to really do it with their very first job, don't that's they? That's right. They do. And that's the problem, is that I think, you know, you, you wonder why there's voids in leadership at the top. And obviously, there needs to be a more concerted effort to have a diverse workforce and a diverse leadership team. I agree. That's on all companies across the board. But the part that's on us is what I like to talk about. And I think you've got to get your best value from the get-go. Of course, it's not going to be the best, best, best thing in the whole world when you're starting out. But the best value you can get, you need to know. And if you can't, you've got to keep trying to get there. And you have to learn to vocalize it. Because I do think that as we make our way to the top, we don't want to be so exhausted by the time we're there and so burnt out by the time we're there that we got to leave. Like, we have to make sure that the path that we forge for ourselves fits our needs. You're going to have kids. You're going to have challenges. You're going to have parents. You're going to have other responsibilities, and there is nothing wrong with that. You need to make it work for yourself. And I mean, like, at Comcast, we just had a huge Know Your Value event and uh, last Friday in Philadelphia, and a lot of it was teaching mid-level star employees, people that we want to retain, how to communicate what they need, how to ask questions about money, about their 401k, how to take time off if they need it, how to get mental health help if they need it. We tend to be really, really worried about what people think every step of the way. By the time we make it somewhere, we're exhausted. But I also you know think, I mean? I, yes, I do know what you mean, but I also <laughs> think we need to, to teach girls to feel comfortable talking about money. Absolutely. You know, I grew up in a family where you didn't talk about money. You never talked about salaries. You didn't. Did you feel just, weird to ask talk, when you were negotiating? Did I feel weird? Yeah. Not at all. No, good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. In fact, my mom, they wanted to give me a decrease in salary to go to CBS. And my agent was like, OK. My mom was like, no effing way. Yay. But she didn't use her. that word. Because she was very, uh, but, but women and money, one person asked, why do women often whisper when they talk about money? And how can we make 
girls more financially literate? Because I do think that's an issue. We've somehow, I don't know, I, I don't think I've done a good enough job with I my don't. girls. I know. Um, I, you know, really trying to talk to them about money. I've started to put them on a budget, so they're learning really fast. That's what I did. Um, and they're very mindful, I think, about mm -hmm. not overspending. Mm -hmm. but, but how can we kind of make the conversation less taboo, particularly among girls and women. Well, I think we need to do it for, I mean, kids model after their parents, so we need to do it for ourselves, and I think it's really important that women consider that. In their childbearing years and beyond, you're an example for your child. So if you don't think you're worth it, my gosh, what are they gonna think? Caddy Kay, a good friend of mine, has the confidence code for girls, and it's awesome, because it is about confidence. I mean, we should be able to speak in a very loud voice about money, about our value, about the things we're great at, and, but we, we've got to use that voice and we have to expect it from our girls. Just a, allow it, but also expect it and promote it. Um, we've got some great questions from the audience. Um, I think this is interesting. Would both of you have agreed to come forward like Dr. Ford? Would both, would, oh, meaning you and me. Um, hmm. Well, you want to go first? <laughs> I think if this had happened to me, yes, I would come forward. I mean, I do. I think I would. Yeah, I... <sighs> I mean, this opens up sort of a can of worms. It, it? does. I mean, I think I definitely would have. I, I don't feel uncomfortable talking about these things, and I know a lot of women do. Um, but I think I, part of the problem is sexual assault is still so associated with shame and humiliation and embarrassment, and it's really just a crime. It's, it's another crime, and, it's not on and it you. should be treated as such. And I think it needs to be destigmatized in society so people can treat it as a crime and act accordingly. So I, I um, was the victim of a sexual assault when I was in, actually, when I was Dr. Ford, how old was she? She was 15 and I you was were 14. 14. And I had detectives and brothers and parents who responded in such a collectively supportive way that I never felt, I never felt any shame about it. I never felt, um, I, don't own it. It doesn't own me. Um, and I, I, so I, for me, I feel like this is something that we've got to, if we're going to get through this and be able to talk about it more, we've got to talk about it openly and, and have a society that doesn't attach shame to it. I didn't feel that way. I did not feel that way at all. Not once. It was so interesting because I didn't know this about Mika. I know you wrote about it, mm -hmm. uh, but you were describing it to me and it sounded pretty terrifying and scary, and you sort of said, it was no big deal. That was my talking to him. You know, I, it was terribly scary. Um, it was horrifying four or five minutes. Um, and um, he had a gun, and he beat me up with it. And I, you know, I was really scared, and I remember I couldn't stop screaming for a long time. I was, I was actually riding um, uh, my little pony. I had a pony, and I would ride to Shady Brook Stables, and I would ride to my riding lesson, and I'd ride bareback with no saddle or bridle, and I would go through the woods on um, Brook Lane off of Old Dominion Road, and I remember every, so I really relate with Dr. Ford's story because um, I related with some of the flashes and the images that she, brought. you remember certain things like feeling like you're gonna die. Um, and die by mistake because you're being hit too hard or something, not in the way that, but I remember feeling like it was just terrible what he did and scared in the time and uh, I remember not being able to stop screaming to the point where I chased the horse away. And I was like, well, I need to get back on that horse if I'm going to get out of here. And I got to stop screaming to get this. You were just 14 years old. Yeah. And so I was like, <sighs> I was trying to stop screaming and I couldn't stop um, because he ran off. And um, so I, yeah, it was an incredibly rough day. But my brothers were, my parents were in 
right on it, and my mother was hugging me, and my dad was talking to cops, and my brothers were running around town with their hunting rifles. Oh, boy. <laughs> And so it was kind of cute. I mean, they were, you know, I don't think they meant anything by it, but they were just cruising around, um, really pissed. And we, my mom slept with me for a few nights, and then she could tell I was okay, and was tough about it. And um, I never, I never felt that it was something to be ashamed of. I was pissed. And so when I say it's not a big deal, I say he's not a big deal. He's just not. And I won't let it own me. Well, maybe the fact that you had support afterwards. You know, I, I, I couldn't help but watch Dr. Ford yes, and be I know. I think so the... affected by the trauma that has haunted her, yeah. uh, really, for so much of her adult life. What a huge impact it had on her as a student at UNC, affecting her. Obviously, she's brilliant. Uh, affecting her so much academically. Mm -hmm. uh, clearly, I think you could... I think deduct or deduce that you that it affected her relationship. That mm -hmm. you know she talked to a therapist about it, and uh, you know it's just interesting how trauma affects people differently and how society responds to it. Because I I think I was very lucky. I guess I mean that's kind of a weird, but the response around me was was perfect, and I was able to move through it. Someone asks, um, you both have daughters, we do, we both have two daughters. What advice do you give them about knowing their value? Well, since they don't listen to me, I will try and talk to them now. Um, the, the book is dedicated to them, and um, you have daughters, so <laughs> it's complicated. I, I really- They like me again, because they they're do? 27 and 22, yeah. I think one kind of likes me, but don't tell her, okay? I, don't jinx it. Um, they both do, they're both wonderful. And um, they've been on this incredible journey uh, along with me and put up with it and it hasn't always been easy. Um, and I, I want them to know that their value starts right now with the way that they're educating themselves, the way they're standing up for themselves, the way they're developing their own futures, their own interests, and I'm so proud of them. And I do this really for them, for this next generation. I want it to be, I don't want it to be easier. I think challenge is important. Rock bottom was sort of good for me in some ways. Um, but I, I want them to get farther um, in terms of their own sense of themselves sooner so they don't wear all this concern. I want them to be happy. And I think knowing your value has a lot to do with being really happy. Okay. Do you want to hear what yes. I tell my daughters? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. I mean, I think that. Well, your daughter just graduated. She did. And that was. I was watching on Instagram. That was yeah. amazing. Yeah. Highest honors. Yeah. Oh my yeah, god. Yeah, she's a smarty pants. Yeah. So my daughter. Yeah, my daughters are both very high achievers. In fact, too hard on themselves and mm. tend to be perfectionistic. So I want. I want them to enjoy life, and I feel like. Uh, they have seen me. I think the best lessons you can teach your kids is how you respond to different situations. And I think my daughters from a very early age saw that I needed to be resilient, that after their dad died when they were just two and six, that they saw me continue to go on, mm. to work hard, to try to find joy in life and in my friends and family. And I remember Ellie, when she was in fourth grade, saying, Mom, I'm so proud of the work that you're doing with colon cancer awareness and research, just out of the blue at the, at, in the kitchen. And I think that children really do follow your lead. And if you're kind to other people and mm -hmm. as nice to the cab driver as you are to the CEO, mm -hmm. they really do, I think, learn from, you know, children have to be carefully taught, like they sing in South Pacific. And I think they really do emulate the behavior uh, and attitudes of their parents. And that's why it's so important to be careful what you say and mm -hmm. do in front of your kids. And to be happy. Yeah, so. Um, okay, a couple other quick questions because we're almost out of time. Um, I know you hate to be asked about Joe, <laughs> um, but come on. Okay. <laughs> Uh, somebody said, over the time you've been together, 
Are you leaning more conservative or has Joe become more liberal? Oh, he's... <laughs> um, that's like, okay. Um, I think that we actually, it's strange. Um, when the show started, we were definitely both on different sides of the aisle. And now we're gonna walk down the aisle. Sorry, I just, <laughs> um, but, but I think it's so interesting with this presidency. I don't know where we are. I think we're, we're just every day hanging on to the truth and trying to Good stick luck. to it. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's hard. It's really tough. This is a whole different ball game. I don't think it's about conservative and liberal anymore. I don't even think, I don't know what the Republican Party is. I think it's about decency and it's, indecency, actually. And it's about the truth, valuing yeah. the truth. So we, we usually, you know, have an impact on so Are you saying Donald Trump has brought you together? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> no, and he did offer to marry us, and that's not happening. Yeah. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> After your father and John McCain, who do you look to as individuals of value, respect, and convention, convictions? Are there people in either party, you and Joe, for that matter, deeply admire right now? I love Claire McCaskill. I'm obsessed with her. Um, I really like Kamala Harris uh, a lot. Um, I think that John McCain was, I mean, if you, um, I kind of consider him the, the perfect ex example of what we need so badly right now, and I pray his spirit carries us forward. Um, did you go to his funeral? I did not. I watched it, and I was in awe. It was, I mean, just the symbolic value of everybody who was there. And the sort of, I mean, it's like he was saluting America and giving a very different gesture to President Trump. <laughs> it was amazing. Basically saying we're number one. It was amazing. <laughs> and it gave uh, me, who I'm kind of negative about the direction we're headed in a little bit too, um, gave me hope, a lot of hope. Um, I want to ask you about working with Joe. I mean, when you get really mad at him about yeah. something and he's really annoying you, um, <laughs> how does that, how do you keep that separate from when you guys are working together? And, you know, are, are you ever just really pissed off? And what do you do about that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, oh gosh, this is going to be so sappy. But, oh, go for it. We okay. could use a little sap yeah. today. We really <laughs> like being together all the time. I mean, it's just fun. And he's so smart, and I, I don't really, it's hard to stay mad at him. And Clearly, um, they're not married. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. My husband's here, too. So I'm Where's just kidding, Mulner, Mulner wherever Where's you Mulner? are. <laughs> I follow you on Instagram. I feel like I know him. Where is I he? I know. I don't know. John, are you here? Okay, better be. Um, Maybe, did he come? Wow, he left. <laughs> he was so fascinated by our conversation. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're scintillating. Um, no, we really, I mean, I'm not saying we don't fight. Um, sometimes we have real doozies, but not, I, it's hard to stay mad at him. He's fun, and he's really smart, and he's a really good man. That's and I nice. love being with him. That's nice. Yeah. Well, we're happy for both of you. Before we go, before we wrap it up, Joe, Joe, do you have any questions for Mika? <laughs> you were on the spot. Are you ever going to marry Yeah, okay. <laughs> because, uh, okay, actually. Where are you going to marry him? Soon. <laughs> okay. Like yeah, Very okay, soon. all right. Joe. Joe, I got you covered. I'll do the follow-up. Mika, <laughs> why have you set a date, and what's the story? Yes, and it's soon, and it's going to be awesome. Does Joe know I'm about it? it? Sort of. Not really. Sort of? Yeah, a little bit, but it's soon. I'm very, you know, I had, <laughs> I had a lot going on over the past year. We had a lot with the show, and my daughter graduated from college, and I was like, you know what, I'm just going to, wait until the right time, but it's very soon, and I'm very excited. Are we all, uh, and I guess the final question, are we all invited? <laughs> no. No. 
I'm sorry. Well, this has been really fun, Mika. Thank you so much. And the book is Know Your Value, and it's available in the lobby.